So what do you think? How many programming languages are there in the world? Maybe 5, 10, maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe 1000? Make a guess. And the answer is, there are more than 10,000 languages available in the market. I mean, think about this. Why would anyone would create 10,000 languages, right? It's because there's not one person who's making all these languages, right? There are different people working on these programming languages. In fact, uh, I feel, you know, if you are working on, I mean, if you are, if you are doing your PhD, if you are doing some research, and you will, you will be thinking, you know, we have lots of programming languages. Can we create our own language, which, which will be better than this? In fact, uh, sometimes I feel that C programming is best. Uh, sometimes I feel PHP is good. Sometimes I feel Java is best. And then, you know, I, I think, can we just merge all these concepts and then, then came, come up with a new language? And that's why we are getting new languages every new every year or every two years. So uh, there are approximately ten thousand languages, and how many we know? Maybe uh, we we heard about maybe uh, 20, 30, and how many how many we know as a programming language? Maybe one or two, right? So in this in this uh, video, we'll talk about the series of programming languages. Not all, not ten thousand, but then we'll talk about the series of programming languages which starts from eighteen forty three. So welcome back aliens, I'm Navin Reddy from Tarisco Learnings and in this video we'll talk about history of programming languages. So let's start with the first programming language. I mean, can you guess in which year we got a programming language? Maybe 1990s? No, because C came before that. Maybe 1960s? No, because there were languages before that as well. What if I say the first programming language came in 19th century? I will. I know you will, you will not believe that because the first computer itself came in 20th century, right? So what happened, you know, uh, you heard about Charles Babbage, right, the father of computer. And in 1822, when Charles Babbage was working on the mechanical computer, and so he thought about a concept where you can actually implement a computer. In fact, before that, in, in 16th century, there was a term called as computer. Person who calculates, you know, as a, as a person, if I use a calculator, I will be called as a computer. And that will be awesome, right? Calling humans as computers. But then this generation, we talk about devices which are computers, right? So in 18, uh, 1822, Charles Babbage came up with the concept of mechanical computer. And with, with, with him, there was, a, there was a lady called as Lady Ada, Ada Lewans, or uh, Lovelace. She created the first programming language. Everything was awesome. Everyone thought, you know, that will be that will change everything in, in future. But then the problem is, in for for next 70 years, there were not any language. I mean, can you imagine that? We got the first language in 1843, I guess, and then out of after that, we got the second language around in second, uh, I guess, second World War or maybe after that. Uh, in fact, you might you might have heard about Alan Turing. Uh, during Second World, Second World War, Alan Turing came with the concept of Turing machine because, you know, in Second World War, they wanted to decrypt the message and to decrypt the message, it was mathematician's job to decrypt the message. And then, you know, it was very difficult for them to decrypt a message by people. And that's why he came up with the concept of computer. Let's create a computer who will decrypt the message. That was Turing machine. And, and in fact, at that time, it was awesome. And then, uh, you know, people thought, okay, that's, that's what computer will be. A computer will be a machine use, uh, in which you have to give the input and it will process your data and it will give, you, give the output. But then they, they wanted some way to interact with the machine. And they came with the concept of electronic machine. Instead of going for the mechanical devices, they came with the concept of electronic machine. And maybe in 1940s or late 1940s, they came with the concept of electronic machine where it will be having vacuum tubes, right? I mean, can you imagine vacuum tubes? I don't know what the size of vacuum tube, but then it was a very big machine. In fact, the first computer was so small. I mean, can you imagine so small? It was, it was so small, it, it used to take only four rooms. There's one room, it used to take four rooms just to accommodate that one computer. Huge, right? Not small. So it was a very big machine and it was working with a vacuum tubes. So they thought about let's reduce the size of it. They instead of going for vacuum tubes, they went for uh, semiconductors. They went for transistors, right? And then they also thought about let's create a CPU because you can program CPU, right? You can ask CPU to do to do, do, to do things for you. Now what happens? You know, we always say computers are intelligent devices. They are smart. I mean, do you think computers are intelligent than, than humans? Uh, not exactly. Computers are not intelligent than humans because computer can do only those things which human say, uh, human ask computer to do, right? Now, how can you talk to computer? Is it easy to talk to computer? Yes, if you can use a common language, 
which I mean a computer and human can understand, right? And that's where they come up with the concept of machine language. So what is machine language now? It's a language which is which works with zero and one, which is binary language, right? So just imagine if you want to talk to a computer using zeros and one, that will not be a good way. Just imagine, you know, you have a computer with you, and then you're talking to a computer. Hey, one zero one zero zero one. The, the thing is, computer will understand, but a computer gives you a response that will be difficult to de decrypt, right? So that's the issue. The second thing is, let's imagine if you're talking to someone on Facebook using one to one and zero 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 zero. I mean, just imagine if you are saying one to one zero zero zero, then you will be getting some bad words from the other side. So you have to make sure that you don't use those language with with humans, and that was difficult for humans to work with that language. So we wanted a language using which actually uh, that language should be somewhere similar to English. And then it should be also understandable com by computer also. And that's where they came with the concept of assembly language. Now assembly language was low level language. Now when you say low level language, it means uh, your computer CPU can understand that, what exactly that language means. There, is, there will be only an interpretation. So you just, write, you, just, you just have to write the code and your CPU will understand what you're saying. Right? That was assembly language and it was awesome. Now, the thing is, uh, assembly is a low level language, not structured properly. It was having lots of problems creating big softwares. In fact, initially it was good to, to work with normal CPUs, but now we are living in a, in a generation where you have octa-core CPUs, where you can, where, where you'll be having huge amount of data to work with. So assembly is not that efficient in that case. And that's why we came with the concept of high level languages. Now when I say high level languages, there were lots of languages at that time. Uh, mostly at that time, when you say computers, they, should, they used to only use for scientific purpose, research purpose, maybe mathematicians used to use that, maybe for rocket launching. I don't know, at that time they were launching it. But then they were using uh, this computers only for that purpose. So they wanted a language using which they can actually work with maps. And they came up with the concept of Fortran. And Fortran came in year, it came in year 1957. Now, if you don't know the full form of Fortran, it's very easy, it's formula translation. That means you can convert your mathematical codes into a programming codes. Everything, everything was good. Then they also came up with the concept of Lisp, which is least processor. Oh, that's weird. A least Lisp, L-I-S-P. And it was also used for maths. But then all the languages are made for maths, right? What about business? Because we, we, also, we, we also want a language to work with business, right? And they came up with the concept of COBOL. Now, COBOL stands for Common Business Oriented Language. So everything was good. We got Fortran, we got Lisp, we got, uh, we got COBOL. But then, you know, uh, let's say we got all these languages now and you want to teach. In fact, after this also, they got lots of languages. We got B language, we got BCPL. But then let's say if I'm a teacher, if I want to teach a programming language to a person, it was very difficult to teach all these languages because there were different languages and different perspective, right? So we wanted our language using which you can actually teach programming to people. And that's where Pascal came into picture. So in 1970, we got a language called as Pascal. Now Pascal, using Pascal, you can teach to people. And then later, it was also implemented for business purpose. You can actually use Pascal to make softwares. And everything was good. We got Pascal. Then in late, late 1970s or maybe late 1960s, at that time, there was a guy called Ken Thompson. And then he thought, you know, we have lots of languages. In fact, Ken Thompson at that time also created one more language called as B language. I don't know if you have heard about that. We also have a B language. Now, B language was there and everyone was happy. We got all these languages. But then if you heard about this, we also had one more uh, OS at that time, OS which is called as Unix, U-N-I-C-S. And I know you, you're talking about U-N-I-X, right? No, the earlier one was U-N-I-C-S and then it was made in assembly language. So Ken Thompson wanted to redesign that OS using a, a what do you say, a modern language. So he thought about, can we use Pascal? And uh, can we use B language? No. Can we use some other language? And then he thought about, let's create a complete language because see, all these languages have their own way of working, right? I mean, they were, they were used for a specific reason. So he wanted a language which would be complete language. And that's where they came with the concept of C language. Now, Ken Thompson with Dennis Ritchie, they came with the concept of C programming. And again, it was made in Bell Laboratories. Now, you, you might have heard about that lab, right? So we have all these languages like C++, C made in Bell Labs. So we got C. Everyone was happy. In fact, C is also called as mother of all the languages because it is the first complete language. You can do anything you want. You can build uh, networking services, you can build OS, you can build uh, embedded software, you can do everything using C language. But then there's a trick here. The trick is, 
what if see in real life we work with objects right in fact uh, the, the thing which i'm holding here it's an object the thing which is behind me it's an object the thing which is shooting me here is an object right in fact uh, these th things around me those are objects but in in virtual world which is your programming world we are working with c language so everything is good we got c uh, we got we got uh, object concept how can we merge this? Because in real life, we use objects. In virtual world, which is programming world, we use procedures. Can we use C language with objects? And it is tricky, right? How can we use objects in C? That's not possible. And that's where there were a group of people, they were working on this concept, and they came with the concept of Objective C. I mean, that means we can have a C language, and then let's introduce objects in that, and your job is done, right? In fact, the awesome thing is, in Objective C, if you want to use C programming, you can use that. If you want to include object, you can do that. It is very flexible. Uh, and at the same time, there was a guy called Jardine Strasser, and he was working on C++. I mean, at the same time, you we were having two languages, Objective C and C++, both derived from C language, and both were introducing object concept. And everything was good. You know, we had Objective C, we have C++. But the question arises, which one you will prefer? Example, let's go back to 1983. It was the year 1983, yes. So let's go back to 1983 and now. And let's say if you are a college student or maybe you are working on a project. And if I ask you to choose one, one language, which one you will choose? Um, mostly people went for C++ because it sounds much similar to C, right? And Objective C was kind of weird because it was working with object. The only company who adopted Ob Objective C was Next. In fact, you, you might have heard about this. If you talk about colleges, they teach you C++, right? They, in industry also, we use C++. It's only the Apple environment now which is using Objective-C. And in fact, you can do Apple programming using Objective-C or using Swift. Why not C++? Because they have not choose C++. Why everyone is not using Objective-C? That's a question, right? We will answer this question in the next video.